Welcome to the Waltham Public Library. My name is Deborah Hoffman and I organize programs and events here. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This program, like all of our programs, is sponsored by the Friends of the Waltham Public Library. So please join the Friends. Uh, before we start, I ask that you silence your cell phones right now. Um, we have had a phone go off before, and it was the presenters, so <laughs> that, was a, that was embarrassing. <laughs> um, so we are super excited because tonight is the first in our Women in Nine series, which aims to celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, as well as highlight the challenges still faced by women today in our pursuit for equality. Um, and we're so excited to be hosting Middlesex District Attorney Marion Ryan as our first speaker in this series, which will be a monthly series through November. Um, the DA has been the Middlesex DA since 2013. Uh, she regularly lectures and leads workshops on workplace safety, teen dating violence, internet safety, and schemes that target vulnerable populations, such as immigrants and senior citizens. She also created Middlesex County's first conviction integrity unit to review closed cases where there has been a claim of potential wrongful conviction. DA Ryan has been acknowledged for her leadership on the opioid crisis and for developing other initiatives aimed at keeping children safe and protecting our seniors. She's a graduate of Emanuel College and Boston College Law School and lives in Belmont with her husband and two children. Please join me in welcoming Middlesex District Attorney Marion Ryan. Thank you. I'm really very honored to be here tonight and to be kicking off this series. And I thought what I would do tonight is I'd sort of break up my remarks into a couple of things. First of all, I'll talk a little bit just about the office because as I was saying a little bit earlier, people don't usually, and that's probably a good thing, know very much about the DA's office except what they see on Law and Order or one of those crime shows. Um, then talk a little bit about my career in the office and finally, just some of the work that we're doing, and then I'm happy to take people's questions. And one of the things that always surprises me, and I know because we've been focusing a lot on this being the 100th anniversary of people getting the right to vote, is in some ways, we've probably come pretty far. And in other ways, we're still talking about a lot of issues that one would hope would have been resolved by now. And I'll give you an example. One of the things that um, I spent the first five years of being the DA as the only woman who was a DA in Massachusetts and really wanted to make sure that little girls and young women had an opportunity to see a woman in this job, which is not sort of a traditional woman's job. So we began running um, what has become probably our favorite event of the year. We do an empowering girls program. And we do two days of it, and each day we have about 250 girls. The first day is middle school girls from fourth to eighth grade, and the second day is high school. And we bring great presenters, and the whole idea is really just for them to think differently about where they are in their lives, what kind of decisions they're going to make, and what they really have dreams about doing. And this year, the theme was empowering gir empowered girls become empowered women. And we began the day with the fourth to eighth graders talking about the question that I put to them, which was, if I hired you and your brother to do some chores, and you did exactly the same chores for exactly the same amount of money, for the same amount of time, and when you were finished, I gave your brother a dollar, and I gave you 79 cents, what would you think? And as you know, nine and 10 year olds, they were outraged. <laughs> outraged that anybody would keep their 21 cents. And we then went on to explain to them that really that remains the way that women are paid. They are essentially losing 21 cents on every dollar. And then we talked about how 21 cents might not be a lot of money, but when you're making money over 40 hours a week, that 21 cents 
adds up and you're actually losing a lot of money. And if you happen to be a woman of color, you are losing even more than 21 cents. So it was very funny because that's kind of became their rallying cry, I want my other 21 cents. So through the whole day as they did things, it was like, I have to make sure that I get my 21 cents. And you know, I was at the State House just last week talking at the Women's Bar Association Legislative Breakfast about that fact that even though we have equal pay legislation, people still are making less money. Um, so there's that piece, and then there's still the legislation that we're talking about, you know, prohibiting child marriage, some of the laws around the protection of women and girls. We in Massachusetts are so far ahead in so many ways, and yet we don't have a lot of those protections. So that brings me to the DA's job, and I think the piece of our job that people are most familiar with is our prosecution of cases. And as I always say, I'm happy to come to things like this tonight because usually when we meet people, they don't want to be meeting us for one of three reasons. You know, either something terrible has happened to them or to somebody in their family and they're coming to meet with us. They've had the misfortune of being in the wrong place at the wrong time and they've seen something and now we're asking them to come be a witness. Or the third, either they or somebody in their family has found themselves caught up in the system and they're being prosecuted or somebody in their family is being prosecuted. So they're never very happy about it. Um, and in Middlesex, that's a pretty big job because we are the largest county in Massachusetts. We are one quarter of the state of Massachusetts, 877 square miles, um, 54 cities and towns, and 21 colleges and universities. So, and the, we, it's a wonderful place to be because we are diverse in every possible way, which is wonderful because it makes us eligible for every kind of grant, every kind of study, because whatever kind of community they're looking for, we have one of those. It is a challenge in terms of the work that we do because we have big cities, big urban areas, you know, Cambridge, Somerville, Malden, which come with all of the kinds of urban problems you think about. We have the big middle section of our county, which is the much more residential communities. And then we have the, what we refer to as the far left end of our county, which is the really very rural part of our county. Um, I joke all the time that I am the only DA who has a, a um, buffalo farm in her county. We have a buffalo farm out in the western part of the county created by a grant from the King of England in the 1600s. So, you know, what you see of that is, first of all, we have the same problems everywhere. They might live in a nicer house. They might be happening to or being done by people who are better educated or who make more money but they tend to be the same kind of problems. And that is true both for the criminal behavior as well as for what causes it. You know, mental health issues do not discriminate based on income, nor do addiction issues. So we see those across the county. And in terms of our colleges and universities, we have, of course, the colleges and universities that are bigger than some of our cities and towns, and we have the much smaller campuses. Those are both places where 18 to 22 sort of ish year olds come from all over the world, often away from home for the first time, experimenting in every possible way. So lots of challenges in terms of education and prevention. They also are a challenge because we spend a lot of our time out in the community doing training, doing education, doing prevention work. And unlike the other communities, a college campus, every year, 25% of your population moves away. So it's a constant re-education process. And, you know, we have come to see that, particularly around the issues of women, and one of the reasons it's so important to have women in these jobs is it still remains the case that the vast majority of victims of our cases are women and children. Um, and that has become even more true with the increase in the number of sort of computer type crimes that we see. Um, it is very often women who are the victims of either that bullying or stalking or kind of cyber activity that goes on. There's also been, and it's in part connected to increased use of the internet and that ability to set things up in human trafficking. So, you know, we no longer really have 
very much of what we used to have when I became a DA, which was you know certain parts of our bigger cities where there would be people on the street at night and people paying for sex and that sort of thing. That really is almost gone. It is much more back page, people online setting things up, things happening in hotels. So that is a real change. It's a real change around how we do investigations. It's a real change about how we protect people from that and make those kind of contacts. We also have a county that is incredibly diverse um, in many ways. In Middlesex County, one in four people was born somewhere outside of the United States. One in five speak a language other than English as their main language at home. We have in our county in Malden, the high school that has the most languages, in this case it's 81 languages spoken of any high school in the country. Um, we are diverse in terms of age. You know, Massachusetts distinguishes itself by having a much older population, and I don't want to scare anybody, but that age is 60. So when we talk about, <laughs> don't be scared. But our population of people over the age of 60 is much higher than other states, and in Middlesex County, it is 10% higher than the rest of the state. That's a great thing because it means that lots of people are being able to age in their communities. But what it brings with it, and particularly when you think the stock market's recent actions notwithstanding, those tend to be people that even if they don't feel it is liquid, have lots of resources. You know, that house they bought for $30,000 in 1964 is now worth 500,000. Um, and lots of people who, regardless of where they fall in the income scale, have a very regular income of some sort. They have Social Security, they have a pension, they have income that starts every month. Both of those things make them very good targets for lots of the scams that go around because either they have lots of money that they can access, or even if I can't get from you a big chunk of money, I'm getting you know $100 or something, because you have income that's coming again next month, I can come back again next month. So there's both the people who can literally, as you see very often, and we try to be very public when we prosecute these cases as a means of prevention, but we have lots and lots of cases where people lose two, three, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. So that's one end of the spectrum, but we have lots of people who lose much less but it is in a very routine $100 a month, somebody showing up knowing that there'll be money coming in every month. So that's a challenge for us on both ends. As to how I came to the DA's office, I went to law school never expecting to practice criminal law. Um, I went to law school really because I had had a member of my own family when I was younger who was in the military and developed a very rare disease and needed to get, it was then an incurable disease, needed to get into some clinical trials and have access to a lot of medication. And you know, I came from a family where English was our first language, we had resources, we had some understanding of the system, and despite their best efforts, it's very hard if you've ever tried to kind of move the military in terms of being able to get services for him, and he was 21 years old at the time. Um, and ultimately, my parents hired a lawyer, and really, almost miraculously, the path was cleared for him to get into a trial program to get medication that the Army had been denying him. And even though he didn't survive that illness, he got many, many years. And it really, I was only about nine years old at the time, but it really changed my view of what lawyers could do. That they were able to open doors that other people could not. Um, and so when I went to law school, I went to law school at BC because they had wonderful clinical programs. And in fact, I spent a lot of my time here in Waltham, um, right up over the old fire station where Boston College had its Legal Assistance Bureau, doing a lot of work on those kind of cases because you were allowed as a student to practice that. And when I was a third year student, I was able to represent some of my clients who had gotten in trouble criminally and defend them. And so, and I also at the same time, many of my clients were in the probate court seeking to get divorces, but they were also Catholic and wanted to be able someday 
to remarry in the church. So they were seeking our help to get an annulment. So I decided that I would try to learn how to do that. And I spent a year and a half at Weston School of Theology to get certified to practice at the tribunal. And just as I finished, the archdiocese decided that women didn't need to be doing that. So, um, which, could, because I don't know, most of their petitioners were women. So anyway, but it's a lot of good knowledge. But um, so I was also def representing, by the time I was a third year, many of the people for whom I'd done wills or helped in the probate court because they or some member of their family had found themselves on the other side of the criminal justice system. And I loved doing that, and that was my plan to do when I graduated. And the second semester of my third year, I had a professor who said, you know, you really should round out your experience and go to the DA's office um, and see what it's like to be a prosecutor. And I thought, I'll go do that, but I'm not really interested. I want to actually be representing people. And I went to the DA's office, and I went to Middlesex. And it's pretty interesting. We just um, had a portrait hanging for Judge Abrams, Ruth Abrams, who was the first woman appointed to the Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts. And she was appointed and served for 21 years by herself until another woman was appointed. Um, it's interesting now that the Supreme Judicial Court is now a majority of women. So that change happened really fast. Um, and she had come from the Middlesex DA's office. She joined our office in 1961. Um, having graduated from Harvard Law School and having been unable to get a job in a law firm. Mm -hmm. And the reason that the then DA was willing to hire her, as I always say, like many men, he became a feminist the old-fashioned way. Um, he was an older Irish, very set in his ways lawyer who probably wasn't particularly interested in the idea that women should be practicing criminal law, but his only child was a daughter. And when his daughter got rejected from a master's program because she was a woman, he was outraged. <laughs> and kind of a, like the light bulb went on to sometimes we don't take people because they may be women, well, I'm going to bring women into our office. Um, and his granddaughter now works in our office, so things kind of come full circle. But he took that plunge in hiring Judge Abrams. Um, and the condition in the beginning, of course, was she had to work in the appeals unit, because you couldn't have women in the courtroom. That would just all be too messy for them. Um, but she eventually won him over and was trying cases. And when I went to Middlesex, one of the real reasons that I decided to go to Middlesex was because I'd by then been bitten by the bug about doing trials. And for every lawyer who does trials, what you're hoping to someday do is a murder trial. And now this was 1980. Middlesex was the only county that would allow a woman to try a murder case. It was considered just too gruesome. You know, women couldn't be looking at those pictures. Women couldn't go out to scenes. Um, and that lasted for a long time. Um, before other offices started having women try those cases. So, you know, I talk all the time to our young lawyers about this, and they think this happened about the time that Archduke Ferdinand was murdered. <laughs> and, and I say, you know, really, the history of women in this office is 59 years. It's not all that long. We now are almost 60% of our lawyers are women. Um, and that is true when you see the courts in general. You see many more women. An interesting piece, though, and when we think about how we still have places to go, is one of the very interesting things is most law schools are more than 50% women now. Most law firms and DA's offices, their entering classes are at least 50%, if not more, of women. That is not true eight or 10 years out. So, and I think there's lots of reasons for that. You know, litigation is hard. Um, 
In public service, it's sometimes a salary issue, although the legislature's been very good to us and we've been able to do a little better around that. But I think it still comes down to lots of personal issues. It's, it's hard to have little kids and be trying cases. Um, as my daughter used to say, Mom, when you're on trial, we're all on trial. So there is that piece of it that is difficult. So really, in the Women's Bar Association, we spend a lot of time now thinking about how do you keep women in the profession? Um, and how do you keep them? You know, Because we've come so far in such a short period of time, you don't want to start going back the other way. And that's what happens if you don't have, because when you look at the number of judges, for instance, we certainly have many more women judges now, but we, it's not 50-50. Um, and if you don't practice for a long time, if you don't get that kind of experience, you're not going to become a judge. Um, and the same is true for other kinds of positions in law firms and DA's offices. And it's very difficult to sort of change that long-term trajectory. It takes a while to do that. And I always tell the story of how I came to be the DA. So I came to work at the DA's office. I started, as everybody does, in the district court and was very happy trying my cases and kind of worked my way through the office and was ultimately trying murder cases and loved my job and eventually became the general counsel of the office. And in 2013, the person who was then the DA decided that he was going to leave in the middle of his term um, and go to private practice. He had kids that were getting ready to go to college, and he just needed to make some more money, and he was going to leave. And I was pretty unhappy because I was in a great spot. I loved what I was doing. I had the freedom to try my cases, to do a lot of the policy and legislative work that I liked. And, you know, I just thought that anybody who comes into one of these jobs is going to want their own inner circle of people and what would that mean for me and my kids were in high school and I kind of thought you know I've got this many more years of they're going to be in school and what should I do and and it is very difficult by that time I had been through five elections and turnover in elections are hard, and I really wasn't looking forward to another year of everybody standing. You know how it is when there's a change. Everybody stands around most of the day saying, what did you hear? What's the rumor? What's going to happen? You know, So I wasn't really looking forward to that. And then it became clear that because of when the DA was leaving, there was so little time left on his term that there would not be an election then, that the governor would make an appointment for the person to run the next time, which was going to be 14 months out. And of course, the rumor mill started about who would be taking these, this job. And I thought to myself, you know, I've been doing this forever. I know this office inside and out. I've done lots of interesting things here. I, can, I see where we should go. I would really love to have the governor consider giving me this appointment. And I had absolutely no political connection or no ability to make that happen. And I sort of went round and round with it. And I thought, you know, if I don't put my name in the mix, we're going to be a year out. I may have to leave this job. And I'm going to think I could be doing this better. But if I put myself in the mix, at least I'll think, well, they didn't choose me, and that's all fine. And it seemed like such a far-fetched idea. I thought, I am telling no one. So I wrote a letter to the governor. and sort of introduced myself and said, this is what I've been doing while I'm here. This is where I think we should go. And one of the things that the perspective that you have, I'd been doing this job long enough to unfortunately have prosecuted the children and grandchildren of people I had first prosecuted. So, you know, we, I say all the time, we are a business in some respects. We are not a business that wants repeat customers. And clearly some of the things that we had been doing were not successful. Because yes, you may be in a situation that unfortunately leads you to criminal behavior, whether it's mental health issues or addiction or whatever it is. And that may replicate itself. But we should not, as the criminal justice system, just be sitting on the end waiting for the next generation to come. We, we know what the signs are. Like, we've been able to figure that out. Why aren't we getting in further? And I had had some success at that point putting together some programs in the office to start doing that. 
Um, I was very interested in doing some of the legislative work because obviously we only enforce the laws that the legislature passes. And there were clearly places where we could change the law or pass laws that would help us to do that better. So I wrote about all of that and I told no one except my husband. And I sent off that letter because I thought if I start talking to people, people will talk me out of it. And meanwhile, every day the Globe sort of had the list of people that were going to be appointed. And after I sent the letter, and this is a piece that I think, you know, in thinking about how women change where they're going and be in different fields, is very often as women, we are obstacles to other women. Because we sometimes give voice to their own fears. Sometimes we factor in our view of things because when I started to tell my friends, you know, I sent this letter over here, um, literally they laughed and said, that can't, po let, how could you think that was going to work out? That can't possibly work out. You know, this is because we're such a big county, we are bigger than 11 states in the country. Um, this is the spot that frequently has led people to go to other places. It's definitely going to be a whole mix of things that are going to cause people to get appointed. And I thought, I don't care. I sent my letter, and if the governor gets a good laugh out of it, that's fine with me. Um, and a few weeks went by, and I got a call one day. I was literally in the dentist chair. And I got a call from the, de from the governor's office, and this lovely woman had a conversation with me on the phone and asked a lot of questions, and I thought, okay, they have now checked off the internal candidate, and they're all set to go forward. You know, they've had talked to a woman, they've checked off the internal piece, and they're going to move on. And a few weeks went by, and I got a call to come for an interview, and I went for the interview, and, you know, the process was just winding around. Now, meanwhile, the list is in the paper pretty much like every week. My name is never on that list. <laughs> All right, so no, I'm thinking nobody's taking this very seriously. Um, and ultimately, I got a call to come and meet with the governor. And to his great credit, the Governor Patrick really had a vision of where he wanted this kind of work to go and, you know, spent probably two and a half hours with a, literally a binder full of questions. And I was going through these questions thinking, I'm going to give you the answer that I think is what I would do. I have no sense. I had never met him before. I have no sense of where you want me to come out on this. Um, and then we got to the end, and he said, I'm going to appoint you the day after tomorrow on the condition that you are going to run for this spot. And I said, sure. <laughs> and I literally walked out. And I thought, I remember walking down the back stairs from the governor's office, and I thought, literally the only public solicitation I have done is Girl Scout cookies. I have no base from which to build. Um, and I still have two kids in high school. And meanwhile, I'm going to be running this 258-person office. But this all seems fine. Um, so you know, and I tell that story to the kids all the time because I think it is an example of when we very often second guess ourselves and don't do things. And, you know, I'm very clear that that could very well have gone the other way. I could have gotten a nice note back thanking me for having applied, but we've had lots of qualified applicants and you are not it. Um, but it still would have been worth it. And I think we don't always think about that or take that sort of plunge. And, you know, at some level, I knew there were probably people beyond my own friends who, if they heard I was applying would think, well, why would you do that? And then, you know, then there's the sort of what are people going to think if I applied and I don't get it, all of that piece. So um, the job part of it, I have to say, was something I knew well. Um, the coming to politics was a different piece and figuring out how to manage all of that and do the things that you have to do. I love the being out. I love talking about the work I, we do. I love the meeting people. You meet really the best people. Um, you know, you've got to raise a lot of money to run in this county. It's a big county. It's a competitive county. I've now run twice um, since being appointed. And you cannot do it without your family. Um, my family have been, who would, none of whom would have ever chosen a public life, have really been troopers. 
about being out and making the rounds of the caucuses and getting signatures and doing all of that. So that's kind of the backstory of how I came to be here. Um, in terms of what we have done, my becoming DA really coincided, unfortunately, with us first starting to see opioids in our county. We do, we have assigned to our office 20 state troopers who respond anytime across our county 24 seven when someone dies who is not in a hospital setting, a trooper from my office along with the local police respond. So, and they are there really for two reasons. One is to see that what it seems to be is what it is. Um, we have, unfortunately, a remarkable number of people who die by falls down the stairs in their house. So they are out there to see that there was no one at the top of the stairs and that they actually fell down the stairs. We have, for instance, an enormous number, um, we had one today, of incidents that occur, occur in workplaces. You know, people fall out of bucket trucks, they get electrocuted, they, vehicles back up on them, lots and lots of things. So our troopers go out and they are first making an assessment of the scene. But the second is that the DA, because we have the authority over any death scene, is charged with really keeping track over the course of a year of how people die. And the idea is to try to do where possible, although I have to say I don't think it ever was really a priority, um, what could we do to prevent some of these things? So one of the things, for instance, you know, we all know that babies' cribs the rules changed about the slats and cribs. Well, that came out of a state fatality review. Um, I think it was Michigan, had seen over a period of time lots and lots of children died by getting their heads stuck in the crib slats. So because they were able to document those numbers and start working for legislation, we changed the way cribs are made. Um, it was responsible for much of the car seat legislation. You may have seen just this week um, as part of the data we've collected around kids, it really appears now that kids, until they are two years old, should face backwards in the car. You know, they face backwards when they're really little. They really are safer facing backwards until they're two. So there's some, le we have, as a result of that, some legislation's been filed to change the rules around car seats. And so in doing that, we would see every year, and the numbers tend to be pretty consistent. You know, we have the same number of whatever every single year. But in 2012, now remember, we have 1.6 million people. In 2012, we had 42 people die of drug overdoses over a 12-month period in Middlesex County. And that included every kind of drug, intentional and accidental. And that number had been pretty consistent for the 10 years before that. In 2013, that number spiked up to 65. And for the very first time, we saw the drug that was the leader, and really we hadn't seen it at all before, but it suddenly became the leader, was opioids. And none of us really knew very much about that, but it was pretty clear that if you go from 42 to 65 in a year, that's not when you've been stable for 10 years, that doesn't bode well. And so we began um, gathering people to learn about that in, in hospitals because we wanted to do two things. We wanted to have access to the medical professionals to really educate ourselves. And secondly, to drive home to people that this was a public health issue. It wasn't just a law enforcement issue. And we began doing that work. That task force has met every single month since then. Um, we have expanded to have six task forces across the county at our various hospitals. And for the first three years that we did that, despite the fact that we were working, we were trying everything. We were able to get federal grants, we were doing all sorts of things. That number soared. By 2016, we had hit 251 overdose deaths. So remember, that's in a three year period. That's how fast this came. Um, and we're working really, really hard. So when you think, I always compare it to Mothers Against Drunk Driving. When I started in the DA's office, in Massachusetts every year 3,000 people died from alcohol-related driving. R last year that number was 193. All right, that's not all that long, and it's largely because of sort of grassroots efforts. And when you think about it, it's been lots of things. You know, Uber and Lyft really were born 
because people didn't want to drive when they had something to drink. It was raising people's insurance premiums. It was putting in jail sentences. It was lots of different things, but we drove that number down. Here, we were doing pretty much the same thing, and the number just kept going. And it really was sort of symptomatic of what kind of addiction this is. Um, in t it was finally 2017 before we started seeing that number decline. We now, in Middlesex County, and this, we are so fortunate. You know, I think we live in a time where we often wonder what does government really do and do they really care about me? And I have to say, and it's certainly not just because I'm a part of it, we are so really privileged and fortunate in Middlesex County. We have both our police chiefs, people who have really changed the way they do their job, our fire chiefs. You know, fire chiefs we used to think of as they're the guys who go spray water on fires. They are now the leaders in our distribution of Narcan to people who are struggling with addiction issues. So that's a big change. Um, we have legislators who really have worked with us around the bills that we filed on these issues. And we have among ourselves, both with our sheriff, um, who we're fortunate enough came from our office, so kind of knows that piece of it. I was yesterday at the law school at BC with Senator Markey, the sheriff, um, the DA from Suffolk County, and Senator Brownsburg. And we were, ta Brownsburg, we were talking about the changes that have really happened here. And when I talk to my colleagues around the state and to my colleagues across the country, they do not have the kind of infrastructure we have here. That really, you know, so this will give you some perspective. From 2013 to 2019, across Massachusetts, all of the time, money, and treasure that has gone into trying to fight the opioid addiction epidemic, really, um, they have seen a decline in deaths of just under 5%. Right? That's a big investment for kind of a small number. During that same period in Middlesex County, we have seen a decline of 29%. And that comes because of that collaboration. So for instance, we have a partnership, you know, many times we have lots of diversion programs, we have drug courts, we have all kinds of alternative services. Sometimes people end up in custody because of that. We have a program with the jail where when people are coming out, we're providing them with Narcan to give people. They're hooking them up to the treatment program. They brought people in to work in there. So we don't see as much of what many other people see, which is that first two weeks that you're out of hospital or jail is when you're most likely to overdose and die. Our numbers have fallen pretty dramatically about that because we've really come together with a lot of systems. And that has been true in so many areas. You know, we have really changed the way we prosecute domestic violence cases because we've been able to bring everybody to the table. Um, one of the things that's been probably the biggest change in our office, you know, for a very long time, people would get charged with a crime, they would come into court, either because of what had happened or because of their record, they would be held on some cash bail. Maybe $300, $500, whatever it was. And if they can't make that bail, and in Massachusetts we don't take real estate, we don't take credit cards, you gotta have the cash in your hand. If they didn't make bail, they remained in custody until their case got resolved, which might be 18 months down the road. Now, when that case got resolved, they might get a not guilty, or they, we might not be asking for a committed sentence. So they would have spent 18 months in jail so they could get probation. Not really an effective system. And yes, a lot of people made bail, but we all know people that if they had to come up with $500 in cash this afternoon, they couldn't do it. And the people who can't do that tend to also work at the hourly wage jobs where when you don't show up, they give your job away. They live in places where their housing situation is kind of precarious. You don't pay the weekly rent, your room gets rented. And most importantly, they often don't have what probably most of us have is a family that can pick your kids up at school. When your kids don't get picked up at school because you've been held, DCF takes your kids. And DCF has a horrific amount of work they do 
a very good job, they work very hard, but no one comes out of DCF with an improved vision of their life. So all the more reason now, you, you've sat in jail, maybe your case got resolved with a not guilty or probation, but you're unmoored from your life because now you're trying to get your kids back, you've lost, you can't get your kids back because you don't have a place to live and you don't have a job because you lost all that. And so about a year and a half ago, we really looked hard at the idea of, in cases where we weren't going to be asking for jail in the end, not asking for cash bail. Um, and there was, as there always is, the whole idea that the whole system would come to a screeching halt and people would never come back to court and all that sort of thing. And we were very careful in how we did it. We rolled it out kind of slowly. We looked at the numbers very closely. And it was pretty interesting. In the first six months that we stopped doing that, the number of people who did not come back to court increased by 0.6%. And then it flattened out. So we have people coming back now at the exact same rate they were before, but they're out and about living their life until we do that. And they're not people we were asking to have go to jail in any event. So it really, you know, our primary job is the protection of everybody's public safety. That's what we have to do. And no one has a crystal ball, so we use all kinds of tools to try to make that assessment of what are we doing. But the system has to be fair. It has to work in a way that is getting people held accountable for what they're doing, but also let's try to figure out why they're doing what they're doing. You know, we don't want them continuing to come back. And how do we figure out what the next step is? You know, one of the things that um, became part of last year's criminal justice bill was restorative justice to be used as part of sentencing. And if you've never seen restorative justice or heard about it, let's just say when they first described it to me for somebody who'd been a prosecutor forever, the idea that we would all sit around in a circle and we would pass around a stone and you couldn't talk unless you had the stone and everybody would tell how what had happened had impacted them and when we were finished, the group would decide what was a punishment. I thought, yeah, I won't be interested in that. Um, but I have to say, then I went to a training program and saw, saw how it worked and I really saw in that circle what I had never seen in court. Lots of times, especially in sort of the district court where you have the less serious offenses, court kind of is like Charlie Brown. Um, you have the person there who's accused of the crime, their lawyer talks, the prosecutor talks, the judge talks, and it's all kind of like wah, wah, wah. And then the person leaves with that chip on their shoulder probably got a little bit bigger. Maybe they have to pay some money or more probably sometimes their parents paid some money. And off they go and there hasn't been really a big change of mind. When you see people sit in a circle and hear what it meant to have their house, hear the people whose house got robbed, what it was like, you took my grandmother's wedding ring. I can't feel safe living in my house anymore. You, and then the person who's accused of that has to give their explanation for what happened. And if you think about even your own interpersonal relationships, nobody wants to hear that they did something that hurt somebody else. And you certainly don't want to have to explain why you did it. And to the people who were impacted by it. That's what causes the change of mind. That really, we now have seen of the people that we've done restorative justice circles with in about a year and a half measurement, and 86% 80, of those people don't come back. They probably don't want to do the circle again, <laughs> but we don't care. I don't care why you don't come back. But, you know, that's, that's something, it doesn't work for everything. You know, there are some places in the country where they use restorative justice in much more serious cases. I'm not sure that I'm ready to do that. Um, we have worked with the sheriff in terms of they use it in the jail now. A lot of our schools use it. It's a way to resolve, you know, instead of sending kids home for what I always say, the suspension when they sit on the couch for two days, restorative justice does a lot more about teaching them what they did and how it impacted somebody else. So it has really become, it's something that we had never done before. Um, 
I'm not sure every place would have taken a chance on trying it, but people who've been impacted by the crime love it because lots of times, for instance, your house gets broken into, the question that people would always ask us, which we couldn't answer, why did they break into my house? Was I targeted? Right? It's a big difference if there's a bunch of drunk kids and they just went down the street and they broke in everywhere. Then they picked on your house and went in there. That kind of changes how you feel about it. In a traditional court process, I don't ever know the answer to that. When you're sitting in the restorative justice circle, you get to ask, why did you end up in my house? And get some kind of an answer. That has made a huge difference. Um, for people who've been impacted and victimized by crime. So I know that's a lot of information that I've kind of covered pretty quickly, but I want to give people time to ask some questions. So I'm happy to take anybody's questions. I've stunned you into silence. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, probably the best example is this. When I first started in the, the DA's office, I was assigned to the Cambridge District Court. And we, I was assigned to screen, which is to sort through the arrests and people who are coming in to be arraigned on Mondays. Monday's the worst day because you've had the whole weekend. So the new person always gets Monday, right? Because everybody who's been arrested from the time court closed on Friday until Monday morning is coming in. And depending on what sporting event is going on or what the weather has been, it is a motley crew. And so I had Mondays and you would see people that would be, you would have somebody charged with a domestic violence, some kind of assault, um, on their partner on Monday. And you might see the victim in that case, who maybe was coming in to post bail for the person that had abused them, um, or they'd come in to get a restraining order. And it was not at all uncommon that you would arraign them, maybe they got a restraining order, and by Thursday, they were back in your office, that they had changed their mind. And the cases kind of just went away. And, and that was after there'd actually been an arrest, because the arrest often followed the four or five times the police had been there and said, everybody separate, take a walk, you know, go stay with your mother tonight, go take a walk, go do whatever. And nobody really wanted to press charges, and it all sort of went away. And there were, as I think often changes people's minds, I, Matt Middlesex tried the very first case of a woman who asserted a defense of having been a battered woman. And the facts, which I actually teach a class, and we talked about this week, and the kids in the class sort of couldn't believe that people got charged in these circumstances. This was a woman in one of our very wealthy communities. Um, the husband who was the abuser had a position of great influence, made phantasmic amounts of money, they had three little children. Um, they lived in a beautiful house where you would not suspect there was violence going on in that house. She was abused for a number of years, almost from the minute they got married. She had three children in pretty rapid succession. She was, as is typical, abused more during the times when she was pregnant. And she had repeatedly tried to leave. She initially went to her family to say things aren't going well. Um, and her family said, he's a great provider, you know, you have a baby on the way, go work it out. She went back, didn't get better. She made her way to her minister, who said, you know, it's a very serious commitment, you now have two kids, and what are you doing? What's causing these problems in your marriage? and go to some counseling and all of that. They tried that and that didn't work. She, at some point, he had threatened to beat one of the children and that prompted her to go to a shelter. And shelter locations, as you know, most of the shelters are in secret locations. So even we don't know where they are. So when we have a victim who's in a shelter, that 
person is delivered to us. We don't know where they are. So we can't ever be compelled to tell anybody where they are. Um, but he had managed, probably through his job, to track down where she was. He showed up at the shelter and claimed that she had kidnapped the children, made such a scene that eventually she just took the kids and went back. And this had continued over and over and over again. She had been in the emergency room thousands, probably not thousands, probably hundreds of times. Um, he was clever in that he would take her to different emergency rooms so she wasn't you know, being seen at the Newton Wellesley every time something happened. She was very well practiced in lying about, you know, she fell down the stairs, she hit her head on the cabinet, she burnt herself, whatever it was. And on this particular day, one of her tasks was to lay out his clothes at night and lay out everything that he would need for his briefcase and all of that. And on this particular day, he called her shortly after lunch and said that he had taken clients to lunch. And when he went to reach for his credit card, his wallet was not in his pants pocket. And that was her fault. And her protestation that she had, in fact, put the wallet there and he must have misplaced it only made him more angry. Um, just as a side note, the wallet was eventually found in his car. But um, he told her that when he came home that night, he was going to kill her. She owned, they only had one car. He had the car. And she was not allowed to have any money. If something had to be purchased, he gave her, you know, $10 today to go do that. Um, she lived in one of our communities where the houses are very far apart. And it was before Uber and Lyft. And she had two kids that were barely walking. So she wasn't really going very far on foot. And she really kind of considered her options of what was going to happen here. And the beatings had been increasing in severity. And at about 4 o'clock, she took the kids down the road to a neighbor's, asked the neighbor to keep the kids for a little bit. She went back to the house, got his shotgun. They had an underground garage, you know, with a couple of steps up into the house inside, sat on the steps. He got out saying, you know, this is it, and she killed him. So that was not the prevailing view back then. <laughs> she was charged with murder pretty promptly. And, you know, the theory of self-defense doesn't activate itself until you've been harmed. So he hadn't actually touched her. And self-defense can't be used legally for something that happened before. So if you punch me in the nose today, I can't come by next week and punch you back. Self-defense is kind of a heat of passion sort of thing. Um, and she went to trial. And she had, you know, probably the perfect case. I will never forget the piles of medical records sitting on the table from every time she had been taken to the hospital. And, you know, there was some cross-examination of her about you went to the hospital this day and you said you fell down the stairs. Yes, I did. But now you tell us you didn't fall down the stairs. No, I didn't. He threw me down the stairs. Well, you lied. How do we know you're not lying now when you say he was going to beat you? Because really there was no witness to what had happened on the phone between the two of them. Um, the people, obviously, when she went to her mother, she didn't say, he knocked two of my teeth out. She said, we're having troubles. You don't go to the minister and say, he's been raping me. You say, we've hit a problem in our marriage. And that was kind of the cross. And it hit, that battered woman's defense had never been offered in the United States successfully. Um, jury was out 40 minutes found her not guilty. And really, that was a turning point. Um, and as I said, she probably had the perfect case. You know, she had tried everything that one could do. She had been in the hospital repeatedly. She really was kind of marooned in this house with three little kids, no car, and no money. And having exhausted reaching out to the people that might have supported her, who kind of said, we can't help you. And I think that just watching that trial, because remember, we charged her with murder. 
watching that child and seeing that unfold. I mean, I've never forgotten that. Um, and it really changed what people just didn't know. You know, people didn't understand sort of the, the psychology of being a victim, of how trapped you could get in all of that. Um, shortly after that, we became the first office in Massachusetts to hire victim witness advocates. Um, the people who really bond in terms of helping get people to services, in sort of hearing those other pieces of their life. And that has changed how we see that. You know, we employ now a lot of, first of all, the prevention piece. We do a lot of work. Last month was teen dating violence, because that is one thing that is a real concern. The numbers of domestic violence cases have declined the number of domestic violence cases with kids under the age of 22 have increased. So we think we have come so far, and yet so many of the situations we see are high school and college kids. I have a group of kids that help us to do our prevention work. And they're great kids. They're in high schools all across the county. They come on Friday afternoons after class and practice, and we feed them pizza, and they help us talk about what the kids say, food, and they will come. But when we started talking about this, we said, do you ever see things like this? And as a parent, it was, even knowing what's out there, the kinds of things they routinely see among their friends um, of abusive relationships. So they put together, it's a great tool if you know kids that you want to have this conversation about, but they put together an app for us. It's free in the App Store. It's called Healthy Heart Matters. And they did real scenarios of things they were seeing in the high school. And it's kind of a test. Is this a healthy relationship or not? You know, if your significant other texts and calls you 800 times and is mad when you don't pick up the phone, is that a healthy relationship or not? And you know, we forget when we say that. We have many kids, unfortunately, who've never seen a healthy relationship. So when you tell them, is that a healthy relationship, well, they haven't grown up in situations where the relationships they've been watching were healthy. Um, so the kids put this app together and there's kind of interesting information for the kids, because that is really, we had in Massachusetts last year 18 women who died at the hands of their partner. There were 24 homicides altogether. Some were male victims. There were a couple of children that were killed in those situations. There were two incidents where mothers and children were killed. That is a very, very significant drop. Um, you know, every year when we have domestic violence awareness, you know, there are lots of those ceremonies where they have either statues of people or they light candles. And I remember when that used to just go on for hours. Um, we would be lighting candles for 45 minutes. Last year, for the very first time in Melrose, we take turns being readers, all the elected officials. And we didn't have enough names to go around, which was an enormous change. So, but the concern is that of those 18, a significant number were under the age of 24. So they are getting younger. Um, so we've done a lot of prevention work around that piece of it. Um, there's a lot of research, pretty interesting research, and we see it a lot, why kids in college, that relationship that really is only three weeks old, becomes the center of their universe. They're away from home, and that's their anchor. So we think, you've only been dating them for three weeks. To them, that is their lifeline. You might remember, we had the case a couple of years ago, the um, girl at Wellesley who went online, bought a crossbow. Crossbows are really big. They're really heavy. She then took public transportation to MIT, where she went into the dorm and shot the young man that she had been dating for a little less than three weeks. OK? So I kept saying, really, she only knew him 17 days. But that they were both sort of adrift. You know, and when you think about kids now, especially high school kids, like, I don't know about most of you, but I did not have communication with my mother 75 times a day. So, you know, they're texting, they're calling, do I like salad? I mean, you know. So those kids, when you take them out of that and plop them down, they, this young woman had literally come around the world. He had come across the country. They're kind of away from that support system, and they just, that relationship is 
so much more important to them than we know. That has become a big part of our training on college campuses with RAs and things. Watch out for those relationships. Be careful. You know, make sure that we're giving people other kinds of support. So we use a lot of the tools to try to identify those relationships that pose the highest risk. Um, you know, there are red flags that the research shows you, things like if you've abused somebody's animals, if you've threatened to commit suicide, if you have guns in the house, um, that increases the likelihood that things will go badly, kind of common sense, but things we didn't used to think about. So that has really changed so many of the things that we do around that piece of education. Wow. I'm sorry? It is, let me just tell you. Anything you ever wanted, you can get it online. Yeah. Um, you might have seen one of the pieces of legislation, which I am all in on right now, is um, to make it illegal to have a ghost gun. So in case you don't know, a ghost gun is a gun that bears no identification, no serial numbers, no anything. And the way you get a ghost gun is either you buy what's called an 80 percenter, it's a gun assembly kit. Think like a making a model airplane, it's that kind of a kit. It comes, they can't sell in that way because of the background checks. They can't sell a completed gun, so they sell you one that is 80 percent completed. In roughly, tw um, one of the reporters last week did it in 29 minutes with no prior training. She did it on Channel 5. You can go online and watch her little report. Yeah, she popped out the little pieces. Of, but I was proud to support this legislation because we had a 13-year-old who was making dozens of ghost guns. 13. OK? Um, so you can get anything you want online. So I'm sorry, did you have a question? The number of deaths has declined significantly. That is primarily because we're located, in some cases, 11 minutes from the Mass General. It really is. I mean, we have many, many people who are shot now who would not survive but for the fact that they can get amazing medical care. For, I'll give you an example. We have many of our shootings occur up in the Merrimack Valley. If the weather is good and that person can be stabilized and put on a helicopter, they make it. They can't, and they're in an ambulance coming down 93 in the traffic, they probably don't. So that when you look at the numbers, you see the number of people who have died by gunshots is down. Um, the number of guns that's on the street is remarkably high. Um, two other pieces of legislation that I filed, one has to do with um, making it a crime. You would be shocked, you probably thought this was a crime. It is not specifically a crime to shoot at someone's house, all right? If you don't happen to hit anyone, and the, the only, I, I am not kidding, the only fortunate thing is that they are bad shots. Um, we have, up again, up in the Merrimack Valley, often on Saturday nights, the sport is driving around shooting. We had an intersection with f over 40 casings in the street. Fortunately, no one was hit. So, but if you drive by and you just put a bullet through somebody's house, the only crime we can usually charge you with is maybe malicious destruction of the siding and discharging a firearm within 500 feet of a house, neither of which carries any significant sentence. Um, we have had a number of people, including one fatality, of people inside their house get hit by a bullet. But I seen just last week, there was an eight month old in Abington, I think, literally in a separate house. The gentleman in this house, who I guess had a legal gun, but anyway, he was cleaning his gun or doing whatever he was, and the bullet went right through the house. Shot the baby in the foot. In the foot, yeah. Um, we had an incident about a month ago where two, in, the allegation is two individuals were shooting at each other in the courtyard of a housing complex. And they took, you know, one took off and the other was running and that one was shooting over his shoulder and the other one was shooting. And clearly they only intended to shoot at each other. And one of the bullets went through the door of the apartment and it was the kind of apartment where, you know, you come in and there's stairs down and stairs up and there was a wrought iron railing 
well, the bullet hit the wrought iron railing and ricocheted into the living room directly above the playpen where a baby was. So we have been extraordinarily fortunate. Um, you know, it's, it's like the valet who was shot at the Brigham last week. P bullets go crazy places. Um, so that, or well, we had the rolling gun battle in Cambridge last year at 3 o'clock in the afternoon where the two cars were driving through Central Square and Memorial Drive just firing at each other. We had school buses and daycare centers and there were just shots flying. So I filed a bill both for the shooting at houses and for the random discharge of guns out of cars um, because the penalties we have for those right now, the crimes we can charge them with, don't reflect the seriousness of what's going on. So yeah, I mean that, we, it is not a secret why Massachusetts is 49th in gun deaths. It's because we have such strict gun laws. But there are these pieces like you can get that ghost gun or you know, we punish you if you shoot somebody or you have an illegal gun on you, but if you're just driving around and we don't catch you and we don't get that gun, we can't address that appropriately. Yeah? Is it really true that all these teenagers that play all these video games and watch all the violence on TV get desensitized to violence or is that just an urban myth? And that they, some of them just space out I think probably the best answer to that, and I talk to the kids about this all the time. I say to the kids, how, is anybody in this room think that drinking laundry detergent would be a good idea? And they say, oh, ah, yeah, no, no, that would be gross. They eat Tide Pods. But they eat Tide Pods because they're filming it. Because it's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, look, there are plenty of kids who play thousands of video games, probably many people in this room, including your kids, who don't go on to commit crime. So I don't think any one thing fix it. I think there is a sense, I do think in a lot of this shooting kind of thing, that people, if they do manage to hit something or someone, are genuinely shocked that, like, the person doesn't pop back up again. I mean, I have seen that that when they hear, like you would think if you were firing a gun out of a car window, you might anticipate that you might hit somebody and they would be seriously hurt. When they hear that somebody has been seriously hurt, they're stunned. So I think there is some kind of disconnect. I don't know how you quantify that. You know, does, a, does an otherwise well-supported child who plays some video games turn to that? I don't know. Do they, are they free to spend endless hours playing video games because they, have lack, they lack other kinds of supervision and support? Maybe. I'm always stunned, for instance, when kids, when you read those surveys and it says, you know, kids are playing something like 10 hours a day of video games. Like, my kids went to school, they had to do their homework, they played sports, like they didn't have 10 free, like I think, who is the kid who has those 10 free hours? You know, I think it's certainly a combination of factors. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is more back to your kind of point about teen violence, but so I'm a senior at Boston College, and like in the past four years, um, like there's just been like countless women around me who've been affected by sexual assault, but I know that like at different at institutions that aren't like public ones, like the proceedings are very different. And at least in like my personal experience, when I've watched people I don't go through it, it just seems, it gets very murky. Uh, Murky's a good word. Yeah, like it's like it's kind of unclear because like names are withheld or we just don't get like full information like what's actually happening when like sexual assault cases are going um, on within the campus. So I was just wondering how close to like the DA's office or like law enforcement outside of like say BC for example, like how close do they work with BC officials? So we have a um we are fortunate, and I, and I talked about the collaboration. We really have good relationships with our colleges. We meet four times a year with the general counsels of our colleges. We've really addressed lots of different things, whether it's immigration issues or it's sexual assault or it's things that, you know, not just affecting the campus, but bigger issues. We do all of our campus police are involved in our training programs for our regular police departments. Um, sexual assaults that are litigated on campus are governed by Title IX, the federal law which sets the standards about that. Um, as you've seen over this year, there's been some 
changes in how that happens. Um, and you know, for schools legitimately, they are in a difficult position because they are, as the law says, standing as parents for the girl, assuming it's a, you know, and it, obviously it's any kind of relationship, but more often it is a female victim and a male defendant. They stand in loco parentis or in place of the parents for both of them. So, you know, and, and I have to say, I have a boy and a girl, so you see both sides of that, right? And in probably 98% of those episodes that happen on campus, alcohol is involved. So they have a difficult job of trying to get together who was there and sorting it out. And, you know, very often the people who are the witnesses are also some also were somewhat impaired themselves. And there's the whole and, you know, colleges and we acknowledge this to them all the time. Colleges are business, too. Um, they come, you know, nobody comes for a parent's weekend and wants to hear that your statistics are X number of people were sexually assaulted on your campus. So they've got that pressure going on. They've got donors, they've got boards of trustees, and they're trying to keep all of that going on. And there also is legitimately the issues of, for instance, somebody who's victimized who says, I don't want anybody to know what happened. I just want him to stay away from me. I just want to go live in another dorm. And then you have just the logistical complications of somebody reports something. There's one in Lawyers Weekly um, that reports cases today, cases of alleged sexual assault on a college campus that got reported at the end of May. Well, everybody has, this is on a big international campus, everybody has scattered now for the summer. So the invest one of the allegations by the person who was accused is it took too long for my investigation. And it's like, well, these people didn't come back till the end of September. We don't run all over the world to track people down to interview them. So this took a long time. So there's a lot at play there. Um, no disciplinary hearing, whether it happens at Waltham High School or at Boston College, do you have the due process rights that you have in court? You know, most college campuses, for instance, do not allow either person to have an attorney. Um, it, they, they allow hearsay to come in, so you got a lot of, I heard, whatever. Um, they don't have the same rules that we have in court about something that happened to somebody else maybe a year ago with these people. It's very limited how much of that can come in in court. In these hearings, there's lots of other things. So they do tend to become very, very murky. And often, the way we get involved in those cases is somebody says, initially, I just want to deal with this on campus. You know, I just want to, I'm, I'm a senior. I just want to get out of here. I want to do whatever. They go through the disciplinary process, and they're not satisfied with that outcome. So now they come to the police department or to our office. Um, so we're often kind of late to the party because now it's eight months after whatever happened and we're trying to reconstruct what happened. They are very difficult cases. They are also cases that my experience in doing those, and I did those almost exclusively for a long time, is the impact on people who are victims in those situations is much more profound than we always recognize. Whatever the level, there's usually not a lot of violence, but whatever the level of trust and relationship, it leaves people often very, in a very difficult place for a long time about how did I trust that person? That person was my friend. Um, you know, it's very different if it's a stranger. If something happens with your Uber driver, that's a whole different situation. You had a right to expect to be safe. You got in the Uber, it went badly. When this person was maybe somebody you were in class with for two years, you were in the play with, you were really friendly with, you, you, know, you share a circle of friends. You, it divides circles of friends. Um, you know, when you try, I've tried a lot of these cases. It's often like a wedding, you know, his friends and her friends. And many times, Somebody will say, a victim will say, I want to go to trial just because I want them to know that I wasn't the liar. Because the story has turned itself around 12 times. So they are, they are much more damaging situations than people always recognize. And I've 
stayed in touch with lots of people whose cases I've prosecuted. It takes a very, very long time. That's why we spend so much time with students, with RAs on campuses trying to do the prevention piece because the impact lasts a very long time. Well, I want to thank you. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> I'm happy to stay and answer your question. Uh, yeah. Well, I was just uh, wondering like, about bullying in the schools. So you must be, you must work with the schools on that too. I was in. It's, it's not controlled. Yeah, it really is very, I spent yesterday morning doing, um, we have a, class, a little program that I do with kids. So I did the fifth and sixth graders and then the seventh and eighth graders. And you know, as I always say, kids have been mean to each other since forever. But it's really different when you have 7,000 texts, when it goes on 20, you know, you wanted to call me after nine o'clock, my mother would have said, sorry, it's too late to call, click. It didn't go on all night long. And I didn't, whatever you said to me that was mean, I didn't read it over and over and over again. So it is that, is something of great impact to our on our kids. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.